Good evening, everyone. Welcome. This is the Monday, September 27th, 2021 meeting of the Northampton uh, Historical Commission. And the notice this meeting is online pursuant to the act extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of an emergency. Remote participation. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a note that probably everybody knows the meeting is being recorded because you probably heard the announcement, but uh, just to reiterate, we always begin these meetings with open public comment. If anybody has anything they would like to uh, share with us, comment on um, that is not related to other items on the, and items that are already on the agenda, um, you're welcome to speak up now. And it looks like we don't have any um, people wanting to speak up. Uh, we'll move on. I have a very brief chair's report tonight. Um, a couple of items. Uh, one is that you may have seen a, um, or maybe not, an email that went around um, from the Mass Historical Commission. They have a new uh, local um, services outreach coordinator. She's very gung-ho, um, very enthusiastic. She just started a few months ago and she's been doing um, outreach to local commissions, commission members to see what their interests might be in preservation. Um, she's launched a series of workshops that are gonna be taking place in the next several months. Unfortunately, they are all full according to my source, but I just wanted to mention that, that in the future, there may be something that some or all of you might take a part in, uh, things such as intro to historic preservation, um, the importance of surveys. Um, there's a, going to be a session on architectural styles and building technologies, um, the basic, basics of running a commission and forming a local historic district. Um, so those are all issues that we um, have, may have in the future, and um, as members of the commission, you may want to take part in one or some of those if she offers them again. And I'm anticipating that she does uh, want to offer them again because there was so much interest. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention in relationship to that, uh, I know some of you know, I know Steve knows this, uh, Craig knows this, uh, there is a historic preservation list serve um, that is free to all to sign up for. And as commission members, I think it would be um, useful to you to just see uh, some of the dialogue that goes on through that list serve. Um, it's mostly commission members, not just chairs, but also uh, people who are part of commissions. And they often uh, pass along uh, challenges that they're dealing with, looking for help or models other communities may have um, discovered and implemented. Uh, so that is a nice, um, that's a nice uh, a group to be affiliated with. That is, if you can stand any, any more um, material in your inbox. Sarah, if you, you have the um, address for that, how to get on the HISPRES listserv, um, if you could share it with the uh, commission members, that would be great. Sure, will do. And the other item I just wanted to mention is work is progressing on the Memorial Park up on Village Hill, a memorial for the former state hospital. Um, the park planting is going to be going in very soon, so that will put the finishing touches on it. And then also there was word from um, both Barbara and Tom Riddell, who worked on the project with Barbara and me, um, that their, the remainder of their interpretive signage is in the works. So that's great to see that coming along. Um, so with that, I think I will um, move on. If any, unless anybody has any questions or comments. Okay. We, uh, next item is approval of minutes. We don't have any minutes. So we will move on to the first of our two local historic district certificate of appropriateness applications. The first of these uh, is related to the up installation of solar panels at 137 Elm Street. That's map ID 31B-167. Uh, all of you have received the materials on this. Um, I'm hoping that the representative um, either the owner or 
the installer of these panels may be available and at the meeting? That's me. Yep. Okay. Are you Dan? Dan, Dan okay. Britton. Sorry. Should have put my last name in there. Sorry. Um, and can you spell that for us, Dan? So we have a record? Sure. B-R-I-T-T-O-N. Okay. Britton. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and are you representing Sunbug Solar? Yep. Okay. Um, so if you have a presentation that you would like to make, you have any visuals you'd like to share with us, I'm sure we can make that possible for you. Sure. If you want me to share my screen, I can, I did a little model, kind of give you an idea of what we're looking to do. Okay. Am I free to share? Should I do that now? Yeah, you should be able to. Uh, Everybody see my screen? Yes. So um, this, this um, a few things open here. So this is the house. Um, it's a fairly complicated roof, uh, roofs. Um, and uh, you know, as far as the arrays, the, there are multiple arrays that are gonna be, I think the, the um, stipulation was within two feet of the roof line. Um, so there are multiples that are it, within that um, uh, uh, threshold. Um, the only one that really is visible from the road is going to be this one um, on, I, I think this is Round Hill uh, Road. Um, Elm Street is to the south on the bottom. Um, and so to give you some sense of what this is going to look like, this is a side-by-side -side of the Google Street View. Um, and so there would be a row of, of panels here, uh, it, six panels that would be here. Um, and again, this is on that uh, Round Hill Road um, site, side of the house. So looking uh, from the east side, um, there would be some panels mounted on this roof back here as well, but uh, you know those are, are set back, uh, so that would be these here. Um, and on the other side, so this is the south side looking from Elm. Um, these these roofs are very flat um, and looking uphill, so these aren't really visible. Uh, just because of the pitch of the roof and because of the height of the building over the road. Um, as far as the wiring goes, everything uh, will be brought, the, the meters are over here on the, on the south side, but we're going to bring all the wiring back on the, on the north side of the, the building down into the basement so there wouldn't be any conduit visible, any additional conduit visible running down the, the front of the building. Um, so that's, that's it. Does anybody have any questions for me? Um, before, uh, we address questions, I just wanted to remind the commissioners, also those in attendance as well, um, that we do have, um, a set of historic district design standards, um, holding them up right here. They're available online. And these were written specifically for this district um, several years ago. And I wanted to just read aloud um, what the standards are for solar, solar collectors, um, just so everyone's clear and for the record. Um, uh, so installation of solar collectors shall not permanently change any architectural feature. A minimum of two feet of roof surface should be visible surrounding the collector array. Framing, piping, insulation, et cetera, should match the roof surface. Collectors should be mounted to match the roof slope parallel to the roof and no more than three inches above the roof surface. And piping should be concealed from view. And then, of course, it's important because this is in a local historic district to consider the building's significance and its architectural integrity. Um, that said, do commissioners have comments or questions? Steve. Okay, I'm trying to mute and unmute. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. 
Um, I guess the first question is, would the installation be reversible if at some point someone wanted to change them or update them? Do you see a way to remove the panels or are they do they become permanent features of the house? Uh, they, they could certainly be removed. Uh, everything is modular and on rails, so it would just be a matter of you know, unfastening them and uh, repairing the roof accordingly. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Um, Craig? Yeah, it's just the first time we've seen a solar array in the local historic district. Uh, I believe that it is. Am I correct, Sarah? Yeah, I'm just thinking of all the properties. Um, even Roundtail? Yeah, I guess we have. That's the first one. Okay. Well, right, th 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 this is the first solar array you're seeing in the historic district? It, I believe so. That's surprising to hear for Northampton, given how much solar there is. Uh, well, I have a few questions. Uh, unless other commissioners um, want to go before me, I'm always happy to. I have a couple more credit. questions. Sure. Yeah, please. Generally speaking, solar arrays are mounted on the south facing side of the house. Very little of this is on the south facing side. How is this? What is the total level of production from this array? Is it really worth the investment? What is it, 27 panels here? Hardly any are south facing? Uh, well, you, you lose about um, 15 to 20% uh, of it. So there's a factor called the TSRF or total solar resource fraction that we calculate on a particular site. Um, and 100% is uh, true south with no shade uh, and a roughly a 35 degree pitch. Um, so for every site, we calculate that number uh, and uh, that's ultimately what we use to determine what the production of the system is going to be. Um, you lose about 15 to 20% if you're facing due east or due west. Um, and the, the pitch of the roof starts to become a, a bigger factor uh, when you, you're facing east and west. So if you're east and west, flatter is actually better um, because you're catching more. So if you're at like a 12 pitch roof and you're due east, you're gonna catch much less of the sun as it comes over the, the, the side of the roof and the side of the roof will actually shade the other side. Um, so flatter is better in that case. Um, I don't know what the TSRF on the top of my head is for this particular site. Uh, if you wanna bear with me a minute, I can look it up. Um, yeah, so let me share my screen again and I can give you a, a visual. So this is uh, the irradiance map that uh, the, one of the tools that we use creates. Um, it uses LIDAR imagery and the satellite imagery to create a 3D view. Um, and then the, the lighter areas are, are the, the best places in terms of uh, where you're gonna get the most uh, bang for your buck. Um, and so, you know, this site's particularly good in that it doesn't have any shade on it other than, you know, the, the worst part of this one is the, the chimneys um, that, you know, we're going around um, and you can see you know, the, the little grainy image here, but you can see how the big chimney in the middle of this roof or, you know, leaving space around it um, is because of that shading there. Uh, but the TSRF uh, uh, weighted average on this one was 83%. Um, and that certainly makes it economical. Uh, you know, once you get down 55, 60%, it starts to be more questionable. Uh, depending on the scale of the project. Frank, do you have other questions? Nope, that's, that's very informative. Thank you so much. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, um, well, I have a few questions. Um, as you heard, I read the guidelines. Um, I was remiss at say, not saying in the beginning of this, the reason why we are reviewing this, so the parameters are normally exempt um, 
but in this case, they did not meet our guidelines and that's why we're reviewing them. And so the question I have is about the two foot um, exposed roof surface surrounding the panel. Um, you, I think Dan, you had stated in your presentation that this was, was within the two feet. Um, I think, was that a misinterpretation? Because it, we're saying there needs to be two feet of roof exposed around it. Yeah, so I think the reason the project got flagged was that there's not two feet around it. No, right. right. And I counted, um, you know, numerous, I mean, places on every single set of arrays where you're not meeting that. So you have to kind of exceed that two, two, two feet. Um, the other thing too is that these panels are proposed for six inches above the roof. Is that because that's what your, um, your detail shows? Uh, oh, the, so from the top of the panel, that seems a little bit high. Is that the schematic you're looking at? Uh, the mounting detail? Let me see. Um, on both you know, numbers on these drawings. Um, the mounting detail, uh, it's detail three on these, the different, the four different sheets. Yeah, that seems a bit high, but yeah, it, it's so there's roughly about three, three and a half inches be, be from the bottom of the panel uh, to the actual roof surface. Uh, and then there is uh, a, you know, the, the panel thickness itself is a couple inches. So yeah, if you add that up together, it's, it's in the range of six inches. Um, that's pretty standard for solar arrays if you've seen them around on roofs. There's different manufacturers that they make different types of racking, but uh, that might vary slightly. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. Um, so, um, given that this you know, is in violation of our guidelines in several um, several areas, um, the commission has to uh, decide whether they um, want to uh, award a certificate of appropriateness regardless. Um, the other option would be to um, issue a certificate based on financial hardship. Um, so I'd just like to hear people weigh in on that. And if you'd like me to explain the financial hardship, uh, I'd happy, be happy to read that again. Steve, you have your hand up. Yeah, I think um, the last sentence in the design guidelines is sort of what's on my mind in the phrase visual impact. And as I look at the structure, it seems like there's a historic house at the core and there's an addition facing the house to the back uh, left, which is attached, and then a freestanding two-story structure, which looks like it has a garage on the bottom. And it seems like uh, the visual impact on Elm Street would be something significant to consider, um, but then also the visual impact with respect to the historic core, right? The resource itself. So you, cl you may clearly have an altered structure, but one that also has a high degree of significance, right? Because of its location. And if you look at the foreign B, there's description of um, the people who live there and its architectural significance. So taking all those things together, I guess, you know, one of the issues I'm weighing is um, visual impact from Elm Street, visual impact related to that historic uh, core of the building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which I guess is maybe a way of saying that, you know, solar panels on their own seem like a possibility, um, but that there could or should be actions taken to mitigate the visual impact, something along those lines is sort of how I see it at this point. Other thoughts about it? Jonathan or Harvey, Dylan? Yeah, 
Actually, could you put up again just so we can see the visual impact? I mean, I think what Steve is saying does seem important. So I guess that's a question. Do you want me to put up the pictures that I had? Yeah, just to let us see again the visual impact. Sure. Uh, let's see. Oh, sorry, I got out of that. So here's the eastern view. Uh, so the panels would be on this roof and then some back here. Uh, and then from Elm Street, there would be panels on the center roof back in here. And then behind this tree, there's another roof. Harvey, do you have any more questions about it after seeing this? Oh, and, and so, and Martha, could you just say one more time, if we were to grant this, it would be under what grounds? the grounds that we would need for to grant it well we can grant it um it, it would be going against our design standards um we would have to take a vote and we could grant a certificate of appropriateness um, we could deny the certificate and at that point we have the option of deciding whether we want to issue a certificate based on financial hardship and i think in this case um, the financial hardship would be the long-term implications from an energy standpoint of not um, doing this. I don't think we're considering at point, this point whether the applicant um, can afford the, po the panels or not. And it, it doesn't have to be limited to just a financial hardship. It, it could be any type of hardship that would be posed, posed by not granting the certificate. Any other question, Jonathan or Dylan? No, I agree with what's been said. It, it doesn't seem to fit the guidelines. Um, I'd love to see a, an altered plan that would more closely fit the guidelines and provide the space and perhaps minimize the, the view, impact of the view from both Round Hill and Elm. Um, but I, I can't see. Just I have another question. Yes, Chris. I just put a full solar array in my roof. And I was wondering, would our historic guidelines rule the day here, or would the city building commissioner's basic guidelines on solar arrays dimension from roof? That's my question, because I know that I could probably fit another several solar arrays if I could come closer to the boundaries, but we're not able to. And I'm wondering which, which guidelines here are that rule the day. Is it the historic district or is it the city building commission's boundaries? You know that answer, Sarah? So it, it's kind of both. Um, the building commissioner won't issue a building permit for this work unless the historical commission has signed off. But any work proposed, regardless of whether it met the um, standards and received a historic district permit or not, would also need to meet the state building code. So what you're saying, Sarah, is even if we issued this, um, the building commissioner said, may say you need to go back and revise. The building yeah, department I mean, is already approved. They, they, well, they, they said that the only thing holding this up is, is this. So. Oh. My question then is, <clears throat> getting a little deeper diving in here, are the solar arrays that are being proposed to be installed here, it's my understanding that there are two. One is the more contemporary, more efficient one, and one is the sort of older style, but slightly less efficient. If it is the higher efficient one here, or the, I'm just curious as to which, solar array is being installed. 
Because if you right. have to track LG neon two panels, they're 21% efficient. Uh, yeah. Not the highest you can get, but pretty close. The LG just started making a higher efficiency. They have a higher efficiency line, but they made them a larger format panel, which makes them very difficult to stick into trapezoids and other non-large rectangular spaces. Um, you know, what, so as, as far as uh, financial hardship, one thing I think that's worth noting is um, one of the, so this, this particular system is the absolute maximum that national grid will allow and still give uh, net metering. Um, and the reason that we're doing that is, is uh, multiple reasons. One is um, uh, the customer uh, has heat pumps in place and, you know, is, is generally electrifying the house uh, and, and that uses a lot of electricity. Um, but moreover, related to the financial hardship part of it, I think uh, there is significant economies of scale in doing a larger system. So, you know, if we're to scale back the system it, to meet the criteria, you know, specifically and say it's half the size, um, the cost per unit energy of the system is probably going to go up 50%, uh, fairly significant. Um, there's a lot of fixed costs uh, in, in what we're doing. Uh, and, you know, once we're out there putting up another five, six panels, isn't that much more expensive. Okay. All right. Um, again, one more time, anybody else have questions? Uh, Steve. I have a question for Steve. A little bit. You're breaking up, Steve. Uh, you've frozen. So we can't hear you. Um, maybe give it a second. OK. There, you're back. All right. Um, my question is, Sarah, can you say a little bit more about the exempt um, provision? Is the idea here that because they're reversible, there's no long-term damage to the district? or um, or is it that the benefits of addressing energy problems outweighs the issues in the district, or is there any rationale that's provided in the design guidelines with respect to that? I, the, so our design guidelines don't go into a whole lot of detail about rooftop solar. That section that's included in the staff report and the one that Martha read it, is the extent of it. Um, the commission can look at the more general guidelines um, on page 19. There's some design fundamentals. It's actually third to page 13. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, so if, if the commission found that the, the work met, even though it didn't strictly comply with the solar standards, if um, the rest of the design fundamentals were met, then potentially you could issue a certificate of appropriateness. Um, or if, if you find that the application um, doesn't create a substantial detriment to the public welfare and, and doesn't really derogate from the intent and purposes of the district, um, th then you could issue a certificate as well. So all of those things are things that the commission will need to consider when weighing whether to approve this or not. So this on page 13 of the guidelines, the design fundamentals. Um, and I'd be happy to go through them with everybody. There are five of them. Um, these are things that we have to consider. Historic and architectural value of the building or the structure and the significance of the site. The general design, building alignment, setback height, articulation, texture, material, and features involved. Relations of such features to similar features of buildings and structures in the area surrounding. The compatibility of the alterations and new constructions with the existing building and site environment present in the district, including the appropriateness of the size and shape of the building or structure in relation to, relation to the land area upon the building and or will be situated into building and structures in the vicinity. Um, and then, of course, considering any kind of um, changes that would be um, would damage the structure or otherwise um, irreversible. They're not re ready, readily reversible. So. It strikes me that the difficulty we're having is that it, it is after all a judgment call. 
Am I am I wrong? Well, I think that that's correct, Jonathan. But a lot of what we do in the district is judgment call, and we have um, the design standards to guide us, and that's why we develop them so that we. Yeah, I understand them. that, but you know, having now studied them before the meeting and heard what I've heard, I think it's down to a, the commission's judgment. That's correct. Yes. I was just one thing to add on the, you know, structural stuff. Uh, so the customer just had a brand new roof put on uh, in anticipation of this. And uh, also uh, it, we've had a professional structural engineer review all of the details of the building and they deemed it adequate to mount the panels. So as far as damage to the, the building goes, uh, we are highly certain there won't be any. Okay. Anybody more, more questions? This is a tough one. Do people feel ready to vote? Yes, no? Will there be an opportunity for public comment on this topic? Um, we have discussion after we uh, make a motion. So we'd be happy to do that. Appreciate okay. Um, if, if there are no more questions from the commissioners, if someone would like to make a motion, Please. It's just a motion. <laughs> we can vote it up or down and we can have public comment about it. I'd move that we approve it. Okay. Does anyone second that? I'll second. Okay, great. All right, further discussion, so public comment. And is it Michael Horahan? Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. I think things were frozen there for a moment. If you could just identify yourself and you, where you, you know, where you live. Surely, uh, Michael Horahan, one twenty-seven Round Hill Road. Um, I'll also share. I'm I'm a neighbor and friend of Mr. Smith, who's applied for the um, the uh, the permission here. So I just wanted to share. I think we were saying before about how there are no other examples of uh, solar installed on roofs in our area. And I think that's a shame. I think that um, climate change is an urgent issue. I'd love to see neighbors taking up the cause and, and doing what they can to um, help with that. So um, in addition, I, we were earlier, I heard discussions about visual impact. I just want to remind folks that I know that across from Mr. Smith's property is the Helen Hills Hills Chapel. I don't think anything would be visible at all. Uh, from anyone along Elm Street or, and there's no immediate neighbors who would see these panels. I, I don't believe it would be a visual impact. Um, we, I heard uh, Mr. Britton say that, um, you know, reductions to the current design would, would severely impact um, the efficiency of the panels. And uh, yeah, I think it sounds as though the two foot rule is a little arbitrary in terms of, um, what the design should look like. Um, so if, if I had a vote, which I do not, um, I would just say I'm, I'm fully in favor of, of this plan. I think it sounds great. Thank you. Any other public comments? I would like to give a comment. Please. Uh, my name is Abigail Smith. I am Justin Smith's daughter. I am 16. I go to the local high school. Um, I am on this call sort of in behalf, on behalf of my father. Uh, he had a work meeting and really unfortunately couldn't come, although I'm sure he would love to be here. Um, I, you know, I, I live in this house half the time and I think the impact, the visual impact would be minimal. Um, and I think that the environmental impact and benefit of having the solar panels vastly outweighs what I see as a relatively trivial uh, visual impact. And, you know, I, as somebody who is very, you know, politically active in the community and, um, you know, does a lot of social activism, I think, you know, climate concerns should absolutely take precedence over minimal visual impact and a sort of arbitrary two-foot rule. 
Uh, so that's my two cents. And I really hope you approve this because it would be really fantastic for my family and my dad's excited about this idea. And we, we think it would be really fantastic for the house and really great for the environment. Um, and once again, is completely reversible um, and does not have, will, will not have, you know, will not give structural damage. And so I think it would be very silly uh, to not approve it. Thank you, Abigail. I appreciate you coming and representing your family. Any other public comments? All right, I think we're ready to take a vote. Sarah? All right, so there, uh, there's a motion to issue a certificate of appropriateness um, in a second. So vote Martha? Yes. Harvey? Yes. Craig? What was that, Craig? Sorry. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Jonathan? Yes. Dylan? Yes. And Steve? Yes. All right. Unanimous. Um, Dan, before you go, I do have one question for you. Um, we we're undergo going to be undergoing a long range planning a project for the historical commission. And I agree with um, what you and Abigail, especially, and also Michael said about how, um, you know, we need to incorporate these technologies into our um, build environment um, and accept them because that's the way we're going. Is there um, work being done to kind of redesign these things? <laughs> There's a lot of talk about uh, solar shingles, as uh, maybe some of you have heard, Tesla has been touting that and selling it, um, and they have they take your money, and then they um, hold your deposit, and then they, they think about it, and then they eventually come out to do it, and then they end up charging you more than they said, uh, and there's a whole bunch of news stories about that. So the, the story with the solar shingles is... Um, you know, they're definitely aesthetically you know, superior uh, than a traditional module. They are significantly more expensive to install, especially, especially on a roof like this, it would be outrageous. If you have a perfectly rectangular roof without any obstructions on it, it might make sense. Um, but generally speaking, that's not the case, certainly not in historic districts. Um, and I, it, it remains to be seen whether or not Tesla will be successful with their product. There's uh, been half a dozen or so companies in the last decade that have tried to make a uh, solar shingle product mainstream, um, and they have either quit or gone out of business doing it. Um, so for now, uh, the standard panel on a frame uh, is the most cost-effective practical way to install solar PV. I think about when we developed these guidelines, it was such a new technology and that um, those were done 11 years ago, almost 12. So it's changing pretty quickly, right? And, you know, perhaps in 10 more years, we will have that option or something even more innovative, right? So. Yeah, efficiencies continue, you know, they, they continue to get slightly more efficient year over year. Um, but the, the thing we're up against now is that everybody wants more because their electric use is going up because things are electrifying, which right. is good, but it's hard to keep up with that demand. Yeah. Um, so. Great. Well, good luck. We'll look for you um, up on the roof. Sometime. Thank you. <laughs> Be careful. Okay. Thanks for coming. Take care, everyone. All righty. Uh, the next item on the agenda is our second um, uh, request for a local historic district certificate of appropriateness. Um, this is for the building at 354 Elm Street. That's map ID 31A-001 and also 23C-43. Um, and this building uh, was is the former Immaculate Conception Church. It was recently purchased by the Seventh-day Adventists, and they are proposing to make some major changes to the building. Um, and everyone received the information from the architect, who I believe is here. Is that Mr. Tuttle? Um, 
I see his name on the screen. Yes. Yes. Okay, <laughs> glad you're here. Um, so we would be happy to um, have a presentation from you. Uh, I think you lay this out in your letter, but um, it's always helpful to hear it from the horse's mouth. Sure. So. Um, what we have is a list of exterior uh, modifications to the existing building, which I will say that uh, the church has now uh, maintained ownership of the property and has done interior work, uh, predominantly mold remediation and, and chasing out some of the, the uh, faults that the mold had been allowed to create within the building so that it is even safe to occupy. Uh, during that time, there was a discovery of several items that lead us to some of the exterior changes that we're talking about. Um, I would start with uh, the replacement of basement windows. Those were original wood double hung windows within a window well. Uh, we have taken a little bit of enthusiasm to uh, also salvage the building by retaining a single fixed light <clears throat> equivalent to the top sash of the double hung window and the only visible portion of the window from the street. Uh, these were all uh, half submerged uh, window wells. And I used the term submerged because that was a big water infiltration problem through the window assembly into the basement causing some of the mold problems. So. Uh, remedial efforts were taken to prevent further water coming in, retaining the, the equivalent top sash of windows uh, in all of those openings. Uh, the next area that was a discovery item is that uh, inspection of the sanctuary ceiling indicated several areas of cracking and bond uh, failure of the plaster uh, into the structure. <clears throat> and that was again, water infiltration and the roof is in dire need of replacement. And there is a parishioner who has offered to a donation to the church to install a standing seam metal roof in an appropriate color for a general appearance that would be very similar to what is on the building presently. Uh, the standing seam would eliminate some of the failures points with some of the flashing and, and other detailing that was inherent to the original roof being a shingled roof, but keep the general appearance. One of the areas that is highly suspect are the eyebrow uh, clear story elements that are part way in the span of the roof. And those are a stained glass assembly that has been long neglected by the prior owners and cause weather to enter the building technically. And so the standing seam roof would run through those areas uh, eliminating those from the visual, which is the strongest visual change that is being proposed. Uh, talking with the, the provider, some uh, physical gesture could be made to incorporate something on top of that roof that would give a, a visual break, but would not be interrupting the roofing that would be proposed to run from ridge to eve. Uh, if we go further down the list, uh, there were items in a conversation with Sarah that you have uh, some, some reservations about, but not a lot of uh, design directions. And that is the handrail and sidewalk repairs that are presently in uh, a dangerous sort of uh, situation with the continued public usage of the property. The uh, handrails, some of which are rusted through, uh, would be replaced. Uh, we could replace in kind or in some, some similar fashion, 
but some of the areas are subject to some fall prevention that we would want to uh, investigate some of that work. There's spalling and settlement issues in uh, much of the walkways, which negate the accessibility that was trying to be achieved uh, in some of those sloped surfaces. So that, but my understanding from Sarah was that there was not a lot of directive from the commission to uh, direct us on the handrail and sidewalk uh, reconfiguration. The exterior doors is a very problematic situation because of poor interior environmental controls over the past several years prior to the current ownership. The doors have suffered badly. Uh, there was no maintenance on the exterior face of the doors. And as such, there is splitting, cracking, daylight visible through the doors uh, that need to be addressed. And so we would be looking to the commission to allow a rehanging of doors in a suitable material that would reduce maintenance uh, on those. We did not make selections or proposals at this time, but it is an area that we would possibly be back before the commission for acceptance of some materials or configuration, but the doors themselves are uh, questionable as to serving the purpose that they're intended. The sanctuary window changes, if the, all the windows within the sanctuary are a stained glass that were original to the building and certainly uh, significant. But the church is also looking at trying to create a building that they can effectively maintain. And these windows happen to be poorly maintained over the years. And at times, the original design of the windows were altered with a uh, aluminum insert of a hopper window so that the design no longer is intact of the original windows. They have, many of the parishioners have, have viewed a building, a Stoddard Hall on 23 Elm Street and the window replacement that was done for that building and would like to have the opinion of the commission to weigh in on a similar treatment using molding profiles and configurations that would be in keeping to those windows, but provide them an opportunity to put an insulated uh, glass panel in there and provide a little bit more energy uh, resource uh, savings and better maintenance. And then lastly, there is a small exterior chapel shell that is a masonry shell that was not original to the building. Uh, it's a little bit suspect as to exactly when it was constructed, but it's a thin, a thin walled brick, single width brick, uh, shell structure that has not been maintained. The freeze thaw cycle has deteriorated it so that it is as much a liability as a fixture on the site. And they would be requesting that that could be removed. It would also uh, improve pedestrian access from the parking lot at the rear of the building to and staying on a pedestrian way versus having pedestrians share a vehicle uh, driveway that would bring them to the church. So it, right now is it's in the way of, of safe passage for the pedestrians attending the church. And so that, that really is it in a very rapid fire uh, presentation. And certainly any one or all of the subject matters could, it's open for discussion. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Tuttle. Um, we, so you are applying for a certificate of appropriateness tonight, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, 
because the reason I asked you that is there it seems like there are a, quite a few sort of things that are up in the air that we don't have a lot of detail about. And, you know, you've specifically said that in the sense of like the door, what you're going to be doing with the door, the handrail. Um, and, you know, the window, you're asking us to consider what they did on Stoddard Hall. So typically, you know, when we're getting ready to make a decision like this, um, we, we like to have all the detail that we can. Uh, so that would be one, you know, one response. Um, and then I just wanted to, um, before I open it up for questions, I just wanted to remind the commissioner, Sarah did a great staff report on this. And um, again, going back to our design standards, um, there are several items on here that, that I think we need to consider um, regarding the roof. Um, the, the standards do not um, allow reflective materials. Um, regarding the dormers, um, dormers that are part of an original design shall not be altered in form or scale, scalar form. And um, retention of historic material, um, original historic material such as curved leaded or stained glass is mandatory. So those are just a few items that, you know, we need to consider that are in the standards. Um, we would be, uh, you know, in, not in violation, but we would be not adhering to the standards if we were to issue. So with that said, um, I'd like to open it up to questions from the commissioners. Anyone want to go first? Dylan, you grew um, up across the street from this church. I did grow up in this And neighborhood. I live across the street from this church. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for bringing up those three points from, from Sarah's report. I, those are the three that really stuck out to me. Um, but just for clarification, the, the chapel shell, are we talking about the a half shell where the statue of Mary was for many years. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. I don't. I don't recall when that was built. That is an issue for me. Then, then the stained glass roof was notable. That's all. Okay. Other questions. Craig, do you have questions? Yes, um, I might be a little bit behind, but generally speaking, when we have something in the report like this, we usually see a presentation with pictures behind the times and not seeing a report with pictures or was there never any pictures to begin with here? And I feel for the, the new owners here that yes, you bought a building that's been uh, Fairly neglected for a long time. It is not alone, and um, and I'd love to see something better happen there. But I don't. It seem like I feel like I'm missing something. Am I? Am I missing something, Mark? So that was, that was what I said at the beginning, Craig. That I think that normally when we are being asked to um, review and weigh in and approve um, something of that's um, making changes to this extent, we need to see full, um, both written and visual. Um, I would have, yeah. Thank you. Uh, you. Know, typically we would see um, elevations. I know that you did su uh, supply one um, that shows where the uh, dormers are being removed. Uh, yeah. uh, no, the, the roof material, you said it's a color. We don't know what that is. Um, uh, you know, usually a simulation. In this case, you're removing original historic fabric. So we need to see a simulation of what this is going to look like. I mean, I went out there today and imagined, I dragged my husband out there at lunch and I would look at it with me and to imagine what it would be like without the dormers. And um, I didn't realize the windows in them were stained glass, which makes it even more complicated. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the windows and wanting to mimic what was done at Sonic Hall, you know, we, we asked for, you know, we cut sheets on those things. So we know exactly what we're weighing in on. Um, so. So the, I mean, in response to some of, of what you read about a reflective surface, the, the standing seam roof is not a reflective surface. It is a compatible uh, color uh, as the existing roof. Uh, it is not an exact match, 
but it is um, it is compatible and, and we could provide additional information. Uh, I did believe that we had sent uh, materials for those who are saying that you know there was not some visuals. I'm not in, unfortunately in a position to uh, display those presently like the, the preceding uh, person. Uh, I'll, I'll admit my age and, and that Zoom is, is not my best friend. And <laughs> I don't think it's anybody's best friend. You're not alone on that one. So I've I've tried to do what I could do old school and just okay. hand, hand the materials in. Um, the in reference to the handrail, uh, through a conversation, I don't want to put uh, anyone on the spot, but Sarah did say that there was little that would be. Uh, imposed or controlled by the commission on the, what I'm talking about is the handrails at fall conditions along the walkway that was introduced to the building for handicapped accessibility. And that that was just a very simple two line pipe rail. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was not thought in how I described it to Sarah as something that was notable or historic in, in any fashion. It was very utilitarian. And so it was simply make it safe sort of approach. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, they, they're so, not um, handrails on the building and they're not original architectural elements. They're, those are only the handrails directly above the sidewalk. Right, there, there's only a few steps into the uh, church structure and there are no handrails on those steps. So that said, um, you obviously understand that that rail must meet ADA uh, requirements. Yes. Yep. For height yep. and um, okay, and and profile and um, you know a grab bar. Right, um, and that's that's the remedial work we're trying to achieve, but we're we are moving forward uh, with all the interior work, and it's the exterior work that uh, the building department is saying. Well, you know, let's. Uh, bring this pace into a more manageable level and get some feedback from this commission. So okay. that's why we're here. All right, so um, let's continue with feedback. Anybody have any uh, other thoughts? Well, I'm, I'm feeling contradictory and I think I'm agreeing with what's already been said. I want to be, I want the commission to be encouraging. I, I think they're on the right track, but I just don't feel there's enough detail here, and I hate to be bureaucratic, but I don't think there's enough detail here for a blanket approval. Nor did we expect a complete blanket approval. It was more if we could minimize the list so that we could move forward in some of the capacities. We're more than happy to come back before the commission with door, you know, proposed door changes. Um, having done some other historic properties, there are a few things that we're weighing right now. One is affordability, what they can do and what they can achieve. Uh, <clears throat> the issue of the roof is, is seasonally an issue and we're trying to advance that. Uh, I can understand and, and we are cognizant of the fact that there are those dormer elements and, but the issue of getting a very functional building that is more easily maintained and altering the some of the key areas that are significant maintenance and actually threatening the structure uh, because of the weather infiltration is the goal that we're, we're trying to achieve here. That's so understood. Yeah. Um, okay, so let is anybody else? Is Steve, I think you had your hand up. Did you? Yeah, hopefully the sound is working um, this time. Um, I sort of see two sets of issues here, some of which um, are big. We might ask for big revisions to the proposed work and others where there might be um, smaller changes or ones that are a little easier to make, like in the mode of providing guidance. Um, things like the 
um, the shell, you know, uh, the sidewalks, uh, issues with some additional documentation might be um, easier to address, but changing the roof to me seems like a major alteration of this uh, church's design and involves significant removal of original materials that are not damaged, right? It's for the proposed work is to, um, for ease of installation or for a, a new type of roof. Um, if, if, if we go in the direction of saying, here's some guidance, come back to us with a different proposal. Rose again. Sorry. Oh, am I breaking up again? You just did, but you're back. Um, propose and the, the a significant change in the uh, profile of the building by altering the roof. Um, so that's sort of how I see the proposal. And maybe I guess there, a question for Sarah that uh, are asking for this kind of feedback is that does the commission generally um, continue the issue or um, deny and then there's a reapplication process or what what kind of choices do we have as commission members? So if the commission is looking for additional information and, and maybe some, some more feedback, um, you could certainly continue the hearing until the October meeting. You do have 60 days with, um, to make a decision before an extension request would be needed from the applicant. Um, so if you don't have enough information, then, then definitely I'd recommend continuing and giving the applicant some clear guidance on exactly what's needed for that next meeting. And if, if I can jump in, uh, we, as an office, were apprehensive about the elimination of the dormers, uh, reading your guidelines, and as such, had conversation with the uh, donor of the material, donor and installer. And it's not without question of retaining a dormer configuration that would closely match what's there. Um, it's certainly more labor intensive than running a, a, a straight roof down uh, through that area. Uh, it becomes a question of just how to handle that. And so there could be further discussion. There was not commitment for or against. Uh, there was a preference, obviously, of a simpler uh, installation. Uh, but you know, I, I would go back to that supplier and we could develop details that would be what would be the equivalent of the dormer as seen from the exterior and uh, how it would be executed. Okay, I mean, I, th I think um, what Steve is saying, correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, is that um, those dormers are, you know, original to the building and they have their they are wood and they have um, stained glass windows in them. And I think, you know, removing them is going is we're going to have some trouble with that because um, it's not something that you can really reverse if you put in another kind of a dormer that's sort of supposed to mimic. So the idea would be to try to achieve saving as much as you can. Um, I think just in the advent of time here, it sounds like we're going to have to be entertaining um, you know, a follow-up um, with, with you, Mr. Tuttle, at the next sure. meeting, which is at the end of um, October. Um, would it be beneficial to provide materials where we're, we're made selections and so forth, so there'd be samples? How does that get distributed in this, uh, this means? Yes, exactly. Um, there are a couple of ways that we've done that in the past, depending on it, if it's cut sheets, you know, we can get those sent around to us. Um, if you're wanting to propose a new building material that can't be uh, sent around by Zoom or by mail, um, it could be left at the building and we okay. could go by and take a look at it. Uh, okay. We've done that with another project recently, actually. Um, but I think we should um, just take each of these items separately and um, I can sort of uh, propose what I'm hearing I think people want to see and then have the commissioners um, correct me if I'm wrong okay 
Um, the basement windows and associated subframes, um, I think we need to see what's actually going in there, the cut sheets on those. Okay. Uh, the roof, obviously, um, you know, if if the metal is something that you want to continue to pursue, although I just uh, want also want to just um, comment on your uh, um, reflection. It's not we're not talking about mirror, um, it, you know, metal is a reflective material. So there's going to be a reflection of the sun. It's not like asphalt or slate. Um, or even the uh, imitation slate, which is a, a polymer. Um, it, it is a material that, you know, sun will reflect off of, and that's what we're talking about. Uh, so, so I think that we need to see, um, you know, what you're proposing to that. I would highly strongly recommend that you look at some alternatives, ways that the dormers can be staved and perhaps using the same material that's on there, which I believe is asphalt. Um, I don't know if your donor deals with asphalt roofing, but that would be an option. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, the handle and sidewalk replacement, as you said, it's a little bit out of our uh, wheelhouse, but um, you know, again, I would just strongly urge you to uh, look at some materials, that, one that are gonna be longer lasting. They sound like they're, they were steel if they rusted um, and not a galvanized steel. Mm -hmm. uh, so using a galvanized steel or an aluminum um, will help prevent that. Um, the exterior door refurbishing, you know, you didn't provide a lot of detail about that. And you had mentioned that you were going to reapply with information about that anyway. That's yep. going to be important because the doors are, you know, are kind of our main window into the building. It's the interface between with the public um, is outside and enters. And I think it, it's something we look at very closely. So I would pay some attention to that. Um, and the sanctuary windows, um, again, you know, we're not, um, we need to have some more detail on that what you're actually proposing. Right. And the Banshell, you know, one thing that would be helpful to us um, is if you could provide some historical information about that. Um, I don't know, Dylan usually is our resident historian on this, but he may not know, it doesn't sound like he doesn't. And if um, you could provide some historical information about that, that would be helpful. I'd be I'd be happy to take a Do little deeper look in the, in the newspaper archives. Okay. All right, that'd be great. And then we can have that at the next meeting and make a decision about whether we think that that's important to keep or not. Okay. Does that help you? It, it does help. Uh, it certainly helps me go back to the committee for the building and plus the uh, individual uh, uh, congregants that, that uh, are looking to not only uh, provide materials, but some sweat equity into the project. So uh, there's still a very positive momentum for the congregation here uh, to bring some vitality back to the, the structure. They just want to make sure that they're doing this with an investment in long term. And so trying to preserve a building um, for their current uses uh, it is, they took it on not as a restoration, but as to just put it into working uh, order. And, yeah. and so the, there are there are some some curves that they have to not navigate at this point to uh, to realize that. OK, yeah. And I um, well, OK, let me finish. Um, does anybody any of the other commissioners have questions or comments? Did I state that properly? I, I think you stated it very well. I just want to be sure that we're not holding things up. And it seems that the process we use allows for mailings to us between meetings. Mm -hmm. And then we can share reactions with either you or with, or with Sarah. Mm -hmm. With Sarah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so Larry, it would be great if you could get things uh, by email to me and also one, Hard copy as well for the city clerk. Sure. No, we would make every effort to do that before the next meeting so everyone has ample time to see the materials since I've proven my incapability to do too much on a shared screen. So. <laughs> I understand. Uh, it's, it's, Sarah, would it be 
prudent for me to copy and I can convert it to a PowerPoint presentation that would be applicable on our Zoom screen here with better close up look at things. Do you want me to I mean, as, as long as everyone has the materials, I, I Craig, I don't know if you got it, but I did send out a, a packet that included okay. the application. Yeah. Um, but as long as everybody has that, that should be sufficient. I, would think. I think so too. Um, anybody else on the commission? And then I have a question. Um, do we need to vote on a continuance? Uh, you will. Yeah. Okay. And it, and it looks like one member of the public also. I do see that. So why don't we vote? Uh, so if someone can make a motion and then we'll have public discussion. Anyone want to make a motion on the continuance? So this would be for October 25th at 5.30. Right. Someone please. Sure, I'll make the motion. That we continue this to. Correct. Okay, a second. Okay, and then we have one individual from the public who had a comment. Is it Jeff Linthwaite? Yes, good evening, <clears throat> Madam Chairman. Thank you, thank you, commissioners. If you could please um, identify yourself and tell us where you live. I'm sorry, my name is Jeff Linthwaite and I'm the uh, regional property manager for the applicant for the Southern Island Conference of Seventh Day Adventist. I wanna thank Mr. Tuttle for his time and his presentation tonight. He's done a lot of work with us to, uh, I wanna say uh, resurrect this building uh, from its current state or its previous state. The city has been working well with us, it's been great. The members are excited. Uh, they sold a previous uh, building, much smaller building, and they're excited about moving into this building. So as one of the commissioners mentioned, uh, time is an issue. Um, weather is an issue. We've been working on the inside to get out mold, and we are anxious to keep the, the uh, winter weather from getting in. And as Larry has mentioned, the doors, the windows, the roof are all uh, uh, an envelope problem. Okay. I, I appreciate the continuance, uh, giving us some time to uh, bring some more detail. I think Larry said it well. We were kind of looking for some feedback from you. Uh, so we went down the right path the first time. And um, we'll take your feedback and go back. I worry about, um, uh, you know, a couple of things. Uh, the congregation looking for a, a roof that is long lasting, low maintenance. You can imagine the size of this roof to com continually be maintain this roof and these dormers, these eyebrow windows is a big deal. But we'll address that the best we can. Uh, regarding the chapel sh shell, um, that is more of a, I, I believe that's more of a, um, an ecumenical issue. It was important to the previous owner. I think there was a statue there. I believe the statue has been removed. So now it's just an empty shell. Um, we're not uh, big into statues uh, and, and outdoor shrines like this. Um, so I appreciate the historical uh, review that'll be done. But right now it's just uh, an empty, uh, I don't know, shell. Uh, it really, I don't know how it provides uh, historical or significant uh, value anymore without the statue in the middle of it. And we won't be putting a statue in there. Uh, if somebody wants it, you're welcome to have it. We're, we're excited to remove it and create a sidewalk or better pathway to the, to the church. Um, and I'm sure Larry will bring back uh, uh, cut sheets and uh, we'll work with our congregation to get you the, the information you're looking for. Feel free to reach out to Larry uh, or my office or anybody with any questions or concerns you have, and we'll do our best. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I, um, I just wanted to say before we end this, um, it is an important, it's a very important part, structure in this historic district. It's one of the anchors of the West, Northwest End. Um, I know the commission for years has I've been on the commission a long time has been concerned about the future of this building and the other Catholic churches in Northampton, which are gradually kind of going by the wayside, not in a very um, gracious manner, I have to say. Uh, so we were encouraged to know that a responsible party had purchased this and um, is willing to invest in it and work with us um, to, you know, continue to make it an important feature in the district and we'll do everything we can to try to help you. Thank you. Thank you. Does the commission have any, any uh, means or methods or ways to help us maintain the historical character of the building? <laughs> I think other than what we've suggested, probably not, but we'll have, we have a month to think about it. Okay. We'd be, we'd be happy to entertain any uh, grants or subsidies or participation uh, on the part of the city to maintain this because the local congregation, uh, we help from the regional office as best we can, but we've got uh, 
over 120 churches that we're trying to help on a regular basis. And this congregation has really stepped up, but this is a big deal for them. So if there's any resources locally uh, to help maintain historic structures, we'd uh, welcome any of that. Okay. Well, thank so, you. Thank you, recorded. Okay, good night. All right. Um, oh, so we have to vote, sorry. <laughs> um, yes, so, uh, motion and second to continue until October 25th at 5.30. Uh, Martha? Yes. Harvey? Yes. Craig? Yes. Jonathan? Yes. Dylan? Yes. And Steve? Yes. All right, you may have thank you. Okay, um, there's just a couple of things left on the agenda. I don't believe Historic Northampton is coming forth, correct? Okay, correct. so we're gonna mm -hmm. talk about that. Um, we need to designate a preservation plan subcommittee. These are uh, would be individuals from this commission who can work with the city and possibly the planning board to see um, shepherd the um, planning process through. And um, if uh, we're not able to make a decision about this tonight, I know Barbara's not here, so it would probably be great that if she were here um, to make this decision, because I know she's been following this a long time. So I would suggest that we move this to the next meeting if that it doesn't hold up the process too much, Sarah, will it? Uh, it, it may slightly, and we're working on a, a, a scope of work and a request for proposal, but I, I don't know how much we'll have. Right, yeah, it's only four weeks. No, probably not. Okay, I guess I, before we should put that to rest, um, are there any folks on the commission that would be interested in doing this? And right, I know Steve is, um, right now, I, we don't have the scope of work pinned down, so I have no idea how much of a job it's gonna be, I hate to say, but um, hopefully, you know, we'll have a good consultant and, but Steve is interested. Anybody else? Okay, um, I'm, I'm weighing whether I have time or not, but um, I certain will, certainly will um, con seriously consider it. And I think Barbara needs an opportunity to weigh in as well. So we'll decide at the next meeting. Um, okay, and then the final item, we have 10 minutes. Um, I brought this up at the last meeting and I just wanna talk with you briefly on, about it again, because it's, it's right in front of us. Um, this is in regard to, uh, the Historical Commission's position on supporting um, the awarding of grants to privately owned for-profit businesses that are that happen to own historic buildings. And this is in regard to the Michelson Gallery downtown. You remember this? Does everyone remember this? Um, you're bringing this up at the last meeting. And um, they have reapplied um, again. So I, I'm, I'm going to be going to the CPC to um, talk about their application once again. And um, I would just appreciate just a brief conversation. I don't know if any of you have thought about this at all. Um, I, um, I'm not comfortable making a position on this as, the, as just the representative. I would like to have more backing from the, the commission itself. Um, so if anybody has any thoughts, I'd love to hear them. I think it's high risk. And why is that, Jonathan? Did you hear me? I, I didn't hear what you said. Oh, sorry. I said, and why is that? Well, because uh, ownership of private property can change. Uh, it would depend on the on the situation. I, I mean. Having a, a general policy, I think, would be at this point would be high risk, and it could be that I just don't know enough. But your concern is the change, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, Craig. I'm okay with it to the degree that there is a there is public there's protection of the public investment. There were. Mm -hmm be a conservation restriction put on the building, maybe in a mortgage-like fashion that would diminish over time, perhaps, I don't know, discussion over 20 or 30 years of that investment. And maybe uh, it would have to be for not some 
minor thing, but it would have to be for something that's that's a capital project that the owner cannot take on. Some capital project that would that would be very important to the streetscape of the community to protect if there was some catastrophic failure imminent that the public investment was needed to come in and then yet be protected by putting a conservation restriction on that project to get the public payback if the owner decided to, to sell the property in a few years that we would be able to get, get participation on. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, I, that's, that's helpful. Steve. Um, I, I think this is a good idea. We do this all the time with historic tax credits, right? I mean, there's public funds that go to support preservation because it's recognized as being a um, public good. I, I agree with Craig's uh, point, although I might phrase it slightly differently to say that, you know, the applicant might be asked to articulate the public benefit. Um, I mean, there's a benefit just from experiencing the building and its contribution to the streetscape. But maybe there's other ways in which they can interpret the history of the building or they can invite public tours or they can make some other um, way to make evident to skeptics that uh, there's something that's in the public interest here. So I think it's good. And I see it the same way I see the historic tax credit. I, I guess I'd also say, I think more applications to CPA are a good thing, right? It, I wouldn't worry about getting too many applications. I think like, um, there's lots of public resources that are in private hands. So um, I, think it's, I think it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Harvey or Dylan? Dylan? Harvey, either one? Dylan? I, I was good, okay, Dylan. Right. <laughs> no, and I think what, what Steve just said is also in line with sort of how we worked in in gray areas or with the say the first churches where they have to sort of demonstrate value of that building um, to the community with them it was all the public work they did but i think leaving some area for, for businesses speak to that issue and how they're building them the community and we can always go to town Okay, thanks. And Harvey. I, I would endorse everything that has been said. But the, um, it seems to me that if you think about it from the negative side, you can, you can read problems. I mean, what the Michelson Gallery folks were saying, and I cannot assess these claims, is we could not fix this roof in the way that it is. And so we'll have to see let it decline or, or change it, but we can't, we can't do it. And that, independent of whether this is true at the Michelson Gallery, particular case, surely that is sometimes the case. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that we would not want to, to preclude to say up front, never could we help in that situation. That, that seems to me that would be a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is, I mean, I, um, that the public, the public good has to be demonstrated. And that is something the CPA, CPC would require anyway. You know, I think one of the reasons why we even took this application up was because it's a gallery that represents local artists and it is open to the public and they have gallery openings and they feature the work of local artists. And, and so it's an important institution in the community from that public standpoint. Um, you know, then there's, but then there's also concerned about um, the public investment being protected. I think Craig, that's a really, really good point um, that, you know, I think about all the things that could happen, you know, so you give them money to restore this roof and then, they turn around in a year and sell it and they make a huge profit and they leave town and then it gets into the newspaper that the CPC has, you know, basically squandered public resources on um, a private deal. Um, not that that would ever happen, but I'm just saying, I'm thinking about the long-term implications of doing this. And then of course, we have thousands of historic buildings in the city that are privately owned that I'll probably all need work. So where does it end? Um, so Craig. I just just popped into my mind there was a case in Belchertown where it was a relatively small investment by the CPC there where they fixed the chimney that was visible above the roof line on property there on their village common sort of 
their village center area. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as a realtor, I go into buildings all the time. And I remember that investment. I thought it was kind of unusual that the CPC did that on a private structure. And they did it to preserve the exterior viewable problem or fix the viewable problem. Mm -hmm. It went down to that basement. That chimney was very deficient. And they didn't cure the problem with the public investment. They only cure the exterior of it. There, but the, the majority of the, the work needed was in the basement that was never cured. Mm -hmm. Somebody had to fix that chimney and undo all the damage or all the renovation that was done on the, above the roof line. Yeah. We've got to be careful about what we would spend public money on to make sure that it wasn't uh, frivolous and just for the view to right. address the underlying problem. Yes, and that's a complicated assessment, I think, that requires a lot of information that, you know, one of the CPA members said, we really don't have the um, expertise to evaluate. And so I, you know, I thought as well, if we don't have the expertise to evaluate, then we shouldn't be, you know, we shouldn't be evaluating, we shouldn't be entertaining applications like this. So this is helpful. Um, it sounds like what I'm hearing, and again, this is something that we can look at in the planning process, is that the city may want to consider a long-term mechanism, whether it's through tax, historic um, property and tax credits, or some kind of a revolving loan fund that would help you know, private homeowners or property owners um, to restore their, you know, their historic structures for the public good. Um, but the CPA may not be the way to do it, may or may not. Um, and maybe some, maybe something historical commission um, manages. So I think that this is helpful to me and I appreciate you weighing in. <laughs> All right. Um, I think that's it for now, unless there's any other business that's um, on the agenda, that was on the agenda, that was unforeseen. Any comments, anything? Okay. Um, it's 6.59. Steve, did you have one thing you want to I, say? I just have one quick question because I work for Smith College. If I need to recuse myself at a future meeting, will you just send me into, if we're on Zoom, send me into the meeting room? Or like, how does that work on Zoom? Because like, it's not like someone can come get me from out in the hallway. Um, do you put the commissioner in the meeting room in Zoom or how does that work? You do not. You can actually participate. You can ask questions. Um, you just can't vote. Okay. Yeah. So, and that would be true for you too, Harvey, because I know you've asked that as well about your wife being a staff member. So. Although my understanding is, I, mean, I sent off to the mayor and I hadn't heard anything. So I understand that that's deemed not to be too bad a conflict of interest. Okay, good. Did you watch the video with a guy in the tan suit? That's my big question. Did you watch the video with a guy in the tan suit? With the amazing accent. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, that video hasn't changed in 30 years. I'm going to guarantee you. Every year. Is it, is it, <laughs> is it time to move adjournment? It's time to adjourn. We're just joking around. Okay. Um, does anyone want to make a motion to adjourn? Sure. Second? Okay. All in favor? All right. Good night. Have a good, good night, everybody. Have a good October.